Just as death and life are inextricably linked, so too for me is death and art. Find out more in today's episode of Art Wonderful, starting in 4, 3, 2, Hello, art enthusiasts and art lovers. Welcome to episode 6 of Art Wonderful, the art podcast where art is a religion. I'm your host, Nicholas Harper. I'm broadcasting from my art studio deep within the Rogue Buddha Gallery that's in the heart of the Northeast Arts District in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I want to thank you for joining me as we explore everything the arts have to offer. It's the mission of this podcast to spread the gospel of the arts, their essential value to our everyday lives, and to offer a deep dive exploration into this most mysterious of subjects. You can learn more about myself, the Rogue Buddha Gallery, this podcast, and those we have on the show by visiting us online at roguebuddha.com. Click podcast from the menu. And be sure to listen to the end of this and every episode, as I'll be sharing my pick of what art event you simply can't miss this weekend, should you find yourself in our neck of the woods here in the Twin Cities. This is brought to you by our amazing partner, we art enthusiasts simply can't live without, MPLSArt.com. Last night, the Rogue Buddha Gallery played host to a Pecha Kucha, what is a pecha kucha, you ask? Well, it's a Japanese phrase that means chit-chat, and it's basically a storytelling format by which participants each get 20 seconds to discuss 20 slides of whatever it is they're presenting. That's 20 seconds per slide, 20 slides total. It's a fast-paced and entertaining way for a number of people to share their ideas in one evening. This Pecha Kucha was presented by Hatch, a subcommittee of the Northeast Minneapolis Arts District. Hatch is tasked with identifying the need and opportunity to create an art center here in the Northeast Minneapolis Arts District. The theme of the Pecha Kucha was death and its role in art. Along with four others, I was one of the presenters and had the honor of sharing the role death has played in my artistic ouvre. Ouvre? Ouvre. It's a French word. I don't know French, so I don't know if I said that correctly, but I think it means body of work. There simply is nothing like sharing stories about some of one's most intimate moments with a group of strangers and friends alike in a PowerPoint-style presentation. The presentation part of the evening was then followed by a death cafe. What is a death cafe, you wonder? Well, that's an informal gathering of friends and strangers in which various issues surrounding the topic of death are discussed over wine, tea, coffee, and treats. A good friend of mine, Kristen Ament, has been hosting death cafes in the Rogue Buddha for the past two years, and as strange as it is to say, it really is a great time, discussing death and dying in a safe environment where people are open to sharing their experiences and learning about that of others. Normally, these two events would be hosted on different nights in the gallery, but this night was special as they both had a common theme, the theme of death. And as such, we decided to blend them into one mega event, all swirling around that most mysterious and elusive topic. With all of that said, I thought I would share my presentation from last night while going a bit more in depth as it relates to this podcast and is directly related to my beginnings as an artist. Before I begin, I just want to say that the evening really was magical, and that each of the presenters offered something truly special to the night, from sharing their personal experiences with death and how it relates to their art, to sharing their art that relates to death in general. I believe this evening was recorded and will be available online soon. When it is, I'll be sure to make mention of it here and share the appropriate links with you. So, now on to the show. While my professional art career began 25 years ago, my call to be an artist, well, that really started 40 years ago, on the night my father passed away. It was just after my fifth birthday. My mother and brother woke me at about three in the morning to tell me the news. I remember that night vividly, as my attention was fixed on a balloon left over for my birthday. It danced in the corner of the room, half deflated. Later, I would think about this balloon, and how it hung there, 
and sort of did a dance as it floated in midair, striving for the sky, but eventually falling under the weight of gravity. The gravity of that night and the realization that my life was forever going to be altered and different from those my age sunk in the next day as my best friend Nathaniel came to the door and asked if I could come out and play. I responded through the screen that I couldn't, that my dad was dead. It wasn't long that three distinctive outcomes emerged from my father's sudden and unexpected death. First, I became an outsider, an observer of the world, if you will. I felt as though I didn't belong and that I wasn't able to participate in the things of the world in the same way that I watched others do. This feeling lasted through grade school, high school, and college, and even rears its head once in a while to today. Secondly, as a result of this, I immersed myself in my sketchbooks, essentially creating a cocoon, a safe space that was safe from the brute realities of the outside world. It was here that I began to draw and sketch my own realities in two dimensions. The worlds I created captivated my attention and occupied my mind. Lastly, I began to endlessly contemplate and search for the meaning behind death and the nature of soul. And this is something that I still do to this day. I also, on a side note, became a bedwetter, but that's neither here nor there. My first encounter with art, where death was concerned, came at the age of 10 by way of a painting at the Minneapolis Institute of Art by James B. Reed. This painting depicts a young boy that has passed, and as was the tradition in the mid-1800s in New England, a memorial painting was commissioned. Oddly, I didn't identify as the observer of the painting or those of the grieving. I identified myself as the young boy in the painting. As in a way, I felt I had experienced a death, that of my childhood. In many ways, that childhood had been defined by the gravity of our being's fragility and eventual earthly demise. In addition to that, as I grew into young adulthood, I couldn't help but feel acutely aware that my mother was as dependent on me as I was on her. With this role came a sense of responsibility to grow up and get mature fast. Perhaps that's why as an adult now, I try to maintain a healthy level of immaturity. But that too is neither here nor there. Many years later, I would paint two paintings in homage of this painting at the MIA. The first was entitled Hiram's Key and depicted a young boy with a crown. The second was called Threnody, which is a musical term for a sad lullaby or lament. And this one depicted a young girl holding a skull. Both paintings representing the death of innocence, naivety, and ultimately childhood. Don't get me wrong though. None of this is to say that I didn't have a childhood or didn't play or that things were necessarily bad. There was, however, this, I guess you could call it a cloud that left its imprint on everything I did and experienced. As a result of my father's passing, we were rather poor as we relied on my mother's income as a church cantor and choir director. In lieu of daycare and preschool, or babysitters, I spent my childhood in the choir lofts of dozens of churches throughout the Twin Cities. My Sunday mornings were spent in these lofts at numerous masses. Saturdays were for weddings, and throughout the weekdays, I spied from over the railings of these choir lofts at countless funerals. No doubt this is where my obsession for candles and incense perhaps originated, not to mention a certain liturgical vibe to the Rogue Buddha Gallery and even my artwork. All of this exposure to Catholicism translated into a religious fervor within myself, and I became an altar boy in the third grade, and was so until I turned 18. I heavily contemplated joining the Croziers, the Christian Brothers, becoming a Franciscan monk, or even a priest. I certainly felt the presence of a call of some sort. This fervor was fueled once again by my impassioned, if not obsessive, desire to understand the meaning of life, through a lens of our mortality. While I wouldn't follow a path of holy orders, I did funnel that fervor into my artwork. An entire body of my work, for instance, which I call the Imago series, 
deals quite directly with my meditations on the soul. In this series, I render in deep shadow, if not blackout altogether, the eyes of the sitter of the portrait. By doing so, I'm playing with the notion of the eyes being a window to the soul. By deliberately removing the eyes from view, I beg the question, does soul exist? And if so, what is its nature and purpose? And if it doesn't exist, well then what? I'm reminded of a favorite quote by Mo Digliani, I'll paint your eyes when I know your soul. As far as I know, he didn't paint many eyes of his models. I hope that's neither a commentary on the existence of soul at large, nor the existence of the soul within his particular models. I guess we'll never know. Many people looking at the body of work called the Imago series in particular, as well as others related to it, might think my work a bit dark, nor, or even macabre. And in fact, they might be accurate from a stylistic standpoint. But it's important for me to note here that I never paint darkness for darkness sake. I don't consider myself to be a gothic painter or someone who fetishizes darkness or the macabre. For me, this darkness is a tool that's used to emphasize the light, my focus always being aimed at the light which emerges from within the darkness. If a portrait, this light is emphasized as highlights on the face and is my nod to the notion that the spirit, life, or light is strong, despite being surrounded by the dark. Even in my landscapes, which again are laden with deep, rich colors, saturated with black, and for me conjure thoughts of a vast void, my focus and attention is always on the light. The light that emerges from the darkness may be in the form of a moon, or a setting sun, or some distant lights of a man-made construction. It took me decades to learn that from the darkest nights, such as that night when I was five, or when losing other friends and family, my oldest brother, for instance, who passed about eight years ago, that from the darkest nights, the light returns naturally and organically. That is, if we allow it to. Of course, the rate at which this does so is different for everyone, and for some, might be very difficult, and it can even be tempting to hold on to the darkness. In which case, whiskey and other vices might provide artificial solace. So I've been told. <clears throat> but I've also learned that we can ignite that light ourselves, within our consciousness and within our life, through our intention and what we choose to focus on. And that's where for me, art has become a vocation and a tool. Not just to bring light into my own life, but hopefully to do so for others who perhaps aren't able to, or ready yet, to do so for themselves. Of course, this isn't the only thing my art is about. It's just one aspect. But it certainly is a big part of why I paint, and what I paint, and why, in many ways, I regard art as a religion. Perhaps most surprising to me, is what I learned about the meaning of death as a result of my countless hours of rumination and endless thought experiments. Now, while this may be true for myself, it may not be true for you. So take this, as most things I say, with a grain of salt. And as always, I would encourage you to explore your most inner being, where issues of life and death and soul are concerned. But for me, this search for meaning in death, it turns out it's a futile one. Ultimately, what I've come to accept is that there is no inherent meaning to be found in physical death. Why someone gets hit by a car and dies, or dies from cancer, or dies in their sleep as a result of pneumonia, as my father did, these are just events that happen. And while we hope that it's never sudden or unexpected, it is predictable. It's a fact of life that we will all succumb to the same fate, and that's just how things are despite how hard we might try and glean some sort of higher meaning from these events. But now here's the twist. These events can have meaning. Death itself can have meaning. And the important thing is that this meaning is meaning that we assign to it, that we give to these events. It's not just death, though. It's about the meaning we give everything in life, and how we choose life, and how we choose to live based on that meaning, and where we place our intention and focus. It's about actively crafting our life. And for me, death has become a reminder 
to be awed and thankful by the fact that we exist at all, and to be an active co-creator of my experience in this earthly realm and hopefully to help others be active co-creators in their own experience on this earthly plane. And again, this is where the power of art, for me, becomes a vocation, as I feel a calling not just to make art, but to do so with an intention, that it be for some higher purpose beyond just beautification of one's surroundings, that it give meaning to all aspects of our life, from birth to death, from the bad to the good, from beautiful to ugly. Art is a tool for our soul to emerge into the light, so to speak. Perhaps it's in this power of intention to craft our experience, not just in the now, but of how we choose to interpret the past, and as such, how we choose to realize that past today, that lies the profound lesson and responsibility of our human free will. The power of intention hits home for me in one of my favorite quotes of all time, from Tom Robbins. It's never too late to have a happy childhood. There you have it, folks. A little deep dive into my psyche and how death has influenced my being an artist and some of the work I make today. This certainly isn't a complete synopsis of what I think about soul and death and afterlife. It's just really the tip of the iceberg. And perhaps we'll get deeper into that in future episodes. But for now, suffice it to say, the important thing isn't to focus on death. It's to use it to appreciate and craft our life right now and to be present for others. And I can't think of a better way to start crafting a great experience in life right now than by taking in some amazing art this weekend. How's that for a segue? If you're looking for an exhibit, might I recommend The Art of Pseudo Manito a solo exhibition of prints and originals, opening Saturday, March 7th from 5 until 8 p.m. at Cryptid Hair Parlor at 2358 Northeast Stinson Parkway in Minneapolis. Pseudo Manito is a brand identity of designer, illustrator, builder, internet recluse, John Reese. Concepts blend socially known ideals, politics, philosophy, dark humor, and the human assumptions of nature. Illustrations vary from vector-based graphics, freehand inked illustrations, screen printing, and found object collages, or a collection of these. You can find out more details about this exhibit, again, opening Saturday, March 7th at Cryptid Hair Parlor, and all of the wonderful art events taking place this weekend at mplsart.com. That's mplsart.com. They have a passion for sharing the talents of our fair Twin Cities like none other, and their directory of galleries and events, it's unsurpassed. So be sure to check out mplsart.com. And that's a wrap for this episode of Art Wonderful, coming to you from deep inside the Rogue Buddha Gallery. I want to thank you for joining me, and I hope you do so again and often. Until next time, remember, the best life is the creative life, and the best self is the artistic self. Cheers. I want to put internet recluse on my business card. That sounds cool.